So, welcome back. We have been looking at event calculus and we have looked at some predicates of the calculus and now let us look at some relations between these predicates. So, in particular the effect of events on fluents. So, this is an event calculus axiom. It says that if an event E happens at time t and it is known that event E initiates a fluent f, then the fluent f holds at time t. So, we can say that if the robot has picked up the block, then the robot is holding the block. But now we have time as a parameter as well. Likewise, if it terminates the fluent, then we can say that if an event happens and it terminates that fluent, then this holds that is talking about the fact about this fluent, that this fluent holds to be true at time t or the, in this case the fluent does not hold to be true at time t. So, hold that is saying that the fluent is true, happens is saying that an event is happening and initiates is a relation between events and their effect on fluents. So, we have seen that events may release the fluent from the common sense law of inertia. So, if, if the event happens and it releases the fluent, then the fluent is released essentially. Then we look at the inertia axiom that a fluent remains the same if it remains under the common sense law of inertia and is not clipped by some event. So, this is the inertia axiom. If the fluent holds at time t1 and t2 is after t1 and it persists between t1 and t2 and it is not clipped between t1 and t2, then it holds at time t2. So, we have to make this explicit logical connection by saying that this was true at time t1 and nothing happened that would change its truth value. So, it holds at a time t2 which is at a later time. This is kind of tied up to this frame problem, it is a well known problem and there is a link here from Stanford that you can have a look at. It is a challenge of representing the effects of actions in logic without having to represent explicitly a large number of intuitively obvious non effects. So, we do not want to make explicit statements that this is not changing, this is not changing, this is not changing. You just want to be able to state the effects and somehow you should be able to make the right inferences. So, here is an example that if you paint an uh, object x with color c, then the color of that object will become c. So, remember that this is an event and this is a fluent, initiates relates an event to a fluent. If you move an object to position p, then the position of that object would become p essentially. And then we are making some statements about what happened. Uh, this is sometimes called as a narrative or the story that uh, the color of a was red at time 1 and the position of a was in the house at time 1. Then at time 2, somebody painted a blue and at time 2, somebody moved it to the garden. So, what is true at time 4? Did moving the block somehow change its color? That is the kind of questions that the frame problem seeks to address as to what are the non effects? How do we handle the fact that one thing does not affect another thing? Painting is independent and moving the block is independent. So, this was popularized by the well known Yale shooting problem by Hang, McDermott and Hanks and it is as follows. There are three kinds of actions. So, this is the world of proportional logic, load, sneeze and shoot. So, somebody is loading a gun, somebody is sneezing and somebody is pulling the trigger. There are three kinds of fluents that you are talking about. One is loaded, alive and dead. So, that is actually negation of alive, you can dispense with that. This is what describes the domain. It says 
that if you load and implicitly it is a gun, then the gun would be loaded essentially. So, the load action initiates the loaded fluent. If you shoot, then it will initiate dead essentially, which is same thing as saying that if you shoot, then it will terminate alive essentially. So, alive and dead actually one of them is superfluous here. Yeah? But this effect of shoot action holds only if the gun is loaded at that time. Then we hear a story that initially somebody was alive. So, we have not introduced variables, this is just proportional logic. Then the load happened at time t1, t sneeze happened at time t2 and shoot happened at time t3. So, this is the story in some sense or as we say the narrative. This is the domain description, this describes the domain. Then we have some information about times because we said T1, T2, T3, we are saying T1 happens before, T1 is before T2, T2 is before T3 and T3 is before T4. So, let the domain sigma be the conjunction of the first three statements and let delta the narrative be the conjunction of the next four statements. or uh, the next next seven statements. So, what is the Yale shooting problem? So, we have this, we just describe these two, the uh, domain and the narrative and let us work with a simple calculus or simple event calculus. We have the following uh, uh, axioms in that calculus. Remember this is prologue like style, so the consequent is on the left hand side. So, a fluent holds f holds a time t if it was initially true and it was not clipped from 0 to that time t. Alternatively, a fluent can hold a time t if an action happens or an event happens at time t 1 and that action initiates the fluent and T1 is before T2 and the fluent was not clipped. This is a second simple calculus axiom. The third simple calculus axiom is basically talking about clipped and it is a definition that we have given already that some action happens between time T1 and T2 and it terminates the fluent. Then the fluent is clipped between time t1 and t2. So, there exists an action. Given this set of axioms or rules if you want to call them. So, given the sigma, the delta and the simple calculus, is it entailed that one is dead? Remember there were three actions, load, sneeze and then shoot. So, did shooting kill someone? I think they were talking about the turkey at that point, they wanted to be kind to humans. So, does the following hold? That is what we just stated that given what we know, the domain, the narrative and the rules of inference. Unfortunately, this sequent is not a valid. So, this whole thing is called a sequent. It is not a valid uh, thing. We, we have not described explicitly the non effects of actions. In particular, we have not said that the sneeze action does not unload the gun for example, or uh, there may be models of this simple calculus uh, in which uh, The sneeze terminates the loaded essentially. In which case, 
a lie would be true and holds that would be false essentially. So, you cannot conclude that the effect of the gunshot is death of someone. So, in addition to describing the non effects of action, we must also describe the non occurrence of actions. How do we know that something else did not happen in the interim period? Also, we must include formally to say that sneeze action and the shoot action are not the same action, that they are different. So, that we can do by including something called a unique name assumption. And it says that load, sneeze and shoot are different, that they are not aliases of each other. And likewise, loaded, alive and dead are also different essentially. So, this UNA stands for unique name assumption. How do we solve this? We resort to something like circumscription, we resort to default reasoning. We are saying that what we have stated is what is true and there are no side effects of actions that we have not stated. So, for example, sneeze cannot unload a gun and there are no actions that have happened that we have not stated. It is not as if they were the gun was shot more than twice or something like that or that it was shot uh, and uh, loaded again and then shot or whatever. So, we know that the idea of circumscription is to minimize the extensions of certain named predicates and we are familiar with this uh, technique by now. So, circumscription of a formula phi yields a theory in which the predicates have the smallest extension allowable according to that phi. The circumscription of phi minimizing the predicate rho is written as circumscribing phi which is a knowledge base or a formula with respect to a predicate. So, this is equivalent to the following second order formula. So, because we are reasoning about the extent of predicates and uh, it becomes in some sense bigger than first order formula. So, we are saying that there is no q such that q is less than p, where q equal to p means that they are the same predicate for all x q x equal to p x, q less than or equal to p means that the extent of q x is contained in the extent of p x. So, q x implies p x and q strictly less than p means that this is true and also that they are not equal essentially. And cir circumscription with respect to p, q is a formula obtained by replacing all occurrences where we have p in this formula by q essentially. And which q do we choose? We q choose such that there is no other q which is smaller than this, this thing. So, remember that the minimal entailment that we talk about, we can express it in a different way as well. So, how do we solve the Yale shooting problem using circumscription? So, given a conjunction of initiates and terminates formula that the domain theory, a set of uh, narrative uh, initially p happens and temporal ordering formulas, a conjunction omega of the uniqueness of names assumption. So, UNA we saw. We are interested in this circumscription, we want to circumscribe the domain theory by saying the extents of the initiates and the terminates formulas are the smallest. The effects of actions are only the effects that we have stated and you cannot have models in which they have some un, unstated side effects. Like for example, we mentioned earlier that sneezing cannot unload the gun for example. And we will circumscribe the events or the narrative by happens that whatever we say happens is all that happens. And of course, the simple calculus and the unique name assumptions. So, if we use this, 
the minimization of initiates and terminates corresponds to default assumption that actions have no unexpected effects and the minimization of happens corresponds to the default assumption that there are no unexpected event occurrences. So, we have already said this, this is the domain from the Yale shooting problem and these are the events that happened. We can now conclude or it is entailed that under the assumptions that whatever we have stated is whatever is known, you can conclude that after the shoot event, someone has died. So, we will leave it here and uh, basically we wanted to get introduced to this idea that there is something called event calculus which goes beyond first order logic. Uh, because first order logic can only take terms which are objects in the domain as arguments. Event calculus can take those formulas of first order logic as arguments or actions as arguments and relate actions to events, talk about change and time and it is therefore a much more powerful thing. We also tie, tie it up to default reasoning and said that if you are, if you know that a sequence of events have happened and if you want to draw a conclusion conclusively which amounts to saying that you can deduce or it is entailed, then you can only do so if you have made the right assumptions about what has not happened, what has not been stated. So, again we are saying that whatever is stated is what is there and based on that you can conclude that the conclusion that you are drawing is true. So, we will stop here and uh, in the next session we will uh, look at the last topic in our course which is epistemic logic which is talks about agents knowing what other agents know. So, we will do that in the next set.